All right. On this episode of the Garlic Marketing Show, we're going to talk about profits, how to make more money. We're talking about one agency that grew 56% while growing their profits 300% in 18 months. I've got Marcel from Parakeeto. Marcel, say hi. Hi, Ian. We're going to talk on this about a ton of exciting stuff. Metricitis, how to avoid the wrong metrics, the four metrics you need to know for your agency, the 80-20 of what you should be paying attention to, how to isolate true profitability. We're going to talk about the difference between starvation and indigestion in an agency, the difference between pricing and scoping, and Marcel's very sexy favorite report, all this on the Garlic Marketing Show. But before we get started, don't forget this is brought to you by videocasestory.com. One of the best ways to grow your business is to attract the right clients, learn about your right clients and everything about them and create amazing videos at videocasestory.com. All right, let's get started. Uh, Marcel, so tell us a little bit, of, you know, we'll get into profitability, but tell us a little bit about Parakeeto, what you guys do. Yeah, our, our specialization is helping uh, digital marketing and creative agencies measure and optimize their profitability. And it, it sounds like a really simple and obvious thing, but of course, anybody listening that runs a business like this and has any kind of scale knows that these problems are actually pretty non-trivial. There's a lot of complexity, a lot of nuance, and it can be really, really hard to answer questions that seem simple, like, are we utilizing our team well? What clients and projects make us more or less money? Are we pricing things properly? When can we take more work on? And do we have to hire people or fire people? Um, and all of these kind of moving targets that as an agency owner or executive team, we're trying to track all the time. It's really hard to do it with data. And that's the problem that we help solve. We help make sure that you've got data and your team has data to make smart decisions and, and focus on doing the things that you love in the business. And when you do this, I mean, yes, people make more money. But when you make more money and you're taking, you know, when you have that more of that cash available and, and you can price properly and you know you're utilizing properly, what are some of the things that it's done for these businesses? Yeah, it's a great question. And because like I don't get out of bed every morning and do what I do uh, and put in the hours that I put in because I'm really excited about an agency owner buying a, another summer home or getting a yacht <laughs> or, you know, stacking up their bank account. The real impact that this has affects all the other stakeholders. And, and it seems backwards, but the employees of that business are usually the ones that benefit the most and the clients benefit a lot as well. Um, what we've seen in a lot of our clients' businesses is that their profitability, we have one client in particular, they grew 56% year over year, tripled their profitability and their utilization rate went down. Their team worked far less overtime, far fewer weekends, and they were able to you know, start looking out into the future and get ahead of resourcing issues. And so everybody was better served. They did better work for their clients because they were not focused on these short-term financial constraints. And they were able to you know, approach their work more mindfully. They were able to turn away clients that weren't a good fit because they weren't desperate for that work and, and direct them to people that were better for them. And they were able to, you know, basically make investments in the places that were meaningful to them, whether that be growth or better culture or better employees or giving their team bonuses. So the lack of financial constraints really just allowed this business and most of our clients as well to act more in alignment with their values. And what I know to be true about a lot of our clients is that they don't have malicious intent, right? They don't start a business because they want to exploit people or take advantage of their clients or their employees. They sometimes are forced to do things that are misaligned with their values because of these financial problems that they tend to run into. It's a great point. You know, I think for the most part, agency ownership gets a bad name. I think, yes, I mean, my opinion is there are some scam artists at the lower levels, but once you get into a decent sized agency, it's good people just working hard and trying to figure it out. And they're good at what they do, but not, not good at a lot of the running of the business. And so how long did it take you to help that agency grow, you know, to get to that point where they could grow in one year and 56% profits and or 300% profits and they grew 56%. Yeah, it was over the course of about in total uh, 18 months of oh. working together. And so the first year it was really about kind of setting or the first six months or so it was about going in, you know, auditing the business, getting an understanding of what was going on and then starting to change the way that they estimated work, the way they structured their data, starting to collect that data. And based on those insights, started being able to make better decisions about new clients coming in, resource planning, hiring decisions. And then it was that following year that they, so about six months in, a new fiscal year started. And that's the measurement period I'm talking about here where their profits tripled. 
they still were able to grow at a, at a decent clip. And again, like looking back on the year there, the thing I was most proud of was their utilization curve used to be these peaks and valleys, right? They go from being like 125% utilized to like zero back up to 125% utilized down to zero. And so their team would go through these wild swings of not having anything to do, being afraid of being laid off, everybody all hands on deck, let's get some new business to, okay, we got a whole bunch of new business. Oh shit. Now we need to do all this work all at the same time. And it, a lot of this just came down to a lack of visibility, forward visibility into the business. So all in all, it was about an 18 month um, transformation, but they started seeing those results, obviously at the start of that fiscal year. And those results just kind of carried through the whole year. That's so interesting that the utilization curve, you're talking about, you know, and I, I probably a lot of people haven't heard that term, but it makes a lot of sense because we see that all the time. It's like everyone's busy, everyone's busy. And I've seen this across industries, you know, like my wife worked in animation and it was just like, boom, and then no one's working. Boom, no yeah. one's working. Why does that happen? Uh, most frequently, there's there's two main reasons for it. Often it's kind of the feast or famine roller coaster that we see occur when a founder is still involved in delivery. Um and so you'll see them go out and sell a bunch of work and then they get involved in doing the work and they kind of forget about selling or they're psychologically distancing themselves from sales because there's a there's a pain involved in selling. You have to pay a price, a personal price every time you close a deal. So it's bittersweet. Um, but beyond that, even when there is a decoupling that starts to happen there, it's generally just a lack of forward visibility. And uh, this has to do with not having clarity on when that work is planned. And so often it all kind of, the timelines all kind of get jumbled together and it all happens at once. It creates a lot of chaos. It, it pulls people in, into focusing on those things. And the second piece is often around a lack of financial visibility. And so you, you get all these uh, deposits from clients, you're flush with cash. You think, oh, great, we have all this runway, but you're not thinking about it in an accrual sense where you're like, oh, actually most of this money doesn't belong to me. We haven't earned it yet. We haven't incurred the cost of this yet. And those, you know, the lack of visibility is often what creates the, this decision-making process where all these things happen to land in the same week, or the timelines don't get spread out properly, or you staff up for a period to meet this demand, but you don't actually have that work out into the long term. And so you end up overstaffed and dramatically underutilized. So there's a lot of dynamics to play into this, but a lot of it just has to do with not being able to see what's going on. Yeah. I mean, that clarity is so important to any business. But very, so few people have it. What are the keys to getting that clarity? It's a good question. And I want to start by just um, mapping out at a high level, like what should you be paying attention to? Because I think metric itis is, uh, is easy to come down with mm. when you get on the internet and you start Googling KPIs for agencies. And of course, like <laughs> you'll find some of our content when you Google those types of things. But uh, most of the agency owners I talk to are measuring a lot of things. They don't necessarily understand all of those things or why they're measuring them. And they usually piece together definitions of these metrics from a, a bunch of varying sources and they're not consistent with one another. And so, you know, utilization mm -hmm. is a really simple example of this, where when you ask somebody what utilization is, you usually get a pretty simple answer. Oh, it's capacity. And then how much billable or delivery time we spend relative to that capacity. But then when you start double clicking on like, okay, well, what exactly is someone's capacity? Does it include vacation time? What about holidays? What about you know the foosball tournament you have every second Friday? Uh, what about sick days and PTO? And, and what is a billable hour? Does it matter if the client was billed for the time or not? What about working on the company website? And you start to see differences in these definitions and these differences are very material and it starts to obfuscate the way that people track these metrics. So the 80-20 of what should you pay attention to, really there's only two things that matter at the highest level. The first is your delivery margin, which is you could think about this as gross margin or contribution margin, just most people aren't measuring it properly on their PL, which is after a client gives you a dollar and you give them the deliverable, what's left? What's the margin on that? When you've spent the payroll and whatever else it costs you to finish the work, what's left over? Delivery margin is the foundation for the agency's profitability because it, it's essentially the cost of doing the thing that you sold. And you want to make sure that on your profit and loss statement, you can identify this number. And usually in order to do that from where you are today, if your PL looks anything like nine out of the 10 PLs that we look at every month, <laughs> you're probably putting all your payroll in one account. You're probably putting all your software expenses in one account. 
And it's very likely that your pass through expenses, uh, which is like money that doesn't actually belong to you in the first place, it's going to ads or print budgets or external vendors or whatever is not being properly isolated. So you need to be able to identify what amount of our payroll is for the people that actually do work for our clients. Are there tools that we pay for that enable them like Adobe Creative Cloud and Figma and so on? When you isolate those things, then you can look at, okay, what was our revenue? What did we spend to earn that revenue? And what was left over? And you want that number to be above 50%. Without that number being at 50% or higher, it's going to be really, really hard to be profitable. And then the second piece of that is overhead. What does it cost us to actually run the business? You know, we have lawyers, accountants, we might pay rent, we might uh, have a website that we host, we might go to conferences and, and spend money on sales and marketing. That should generally be under 30% of your agency gross income, uh, which is your revenue minus pass through. And that should leave you with at least a 20% margin. And the delivery margin metric is the most important metric for your business is the one that almost no one is paying attention to, but it is the foundation. The higher that number is, the easier it is to run the business and still be profitable. And I can talk about the three things that move that number. And so ultimately you end up with four numbers that if you just pay attention to these four numbers, you could see everything you need to see about the business. So let's talk about those four numbers. Number one is delivery margin. So there's a, there's a triangle, three things that move delivery margin. Actually, this is a video show, so I can share my screen yes. and that will push everybody to uh, look at the video as well. Um, so I'll draw it out. Uh, delivery margin. Let's see here. Okay. So the formula for delivery margin is the following. It's agency gross income, which again is just the money that you collect from a client minus everything that doesn't belong to you, like ad spend and you know things that pass through you, et cetera, minus your delivery cost, which is generally the cost of the, the people or the time that goes into getting this thing done divided by AGI. So to give you an example, if I made a million dollars this year and I spent $400,000 on people and software to get that work done, divided by a million dollars, I'd have a 60% delivery margin, right? So there's three things that we can do to move that number. So AGI minus delivery cost over AGI, okay? The first has to do with uh, decreasing our delivery costs. So can we get the same work done for cheaper? And that really comes down to our average cost per hour, right? How expensive are the people that do this work? Um, so this is one that not a lot of people are interested in paying a lot of attention to, uh, and for good reason, right? Maybe you like the people you work with, maybe you're not interested in using lower cost staff, but uh, a lot of times there are opportunities for this in the business. So I'll give you an example. At Parakeeto, I used to do 100% of the work on a client engagement. Uh, and when I hire somebody to do that job, you know, it's about $150,000 a year job, give or take, right? It's an expensive skill set to hire for. It requires a lot of experience and expertise. So a cost per hour on a person that costs 150 grand a year is about, you know, 150 divided by 2080, $72 an hour. If I can find somebody for $70,000 a year to do half of that work, I am dramatically decreasing my cost per hour. Right? It's going down by an order of magnitude. And so the relationship, if you think about delivery margin as the relationship between delivery cost and AGI, at scale, my payroll is materially lower because instead of hiring two people at 150K to do a certain amount of work, I hire one at 150 and another one at 75. That $75,000 is now going to the bottom line. So decreasing your average cost per hour is a very legitimate way to create more space between what you get paid and what it costs you to get the work done. And a lot of this has to do with maturing your products, your services, defining those things, writing down better processes, using technology automation, and really just decreasing the amount of judgment that's required to get a deliverable done and trying to use that decreased amount of judgment that's required to ultimately hire people that have less experience because less experience generally equates to less judgment and less experience typically means that they're less expensive. And that could look like hiring more junior people. It could look like offshoring, whatever that is. So that's the first lever. It's simple. It's not necessarily easy, but it's simple, right? Get the same work done, but have it cost less. And then the other two metrics that control delivery margin, my handwriting is terrible. I'm aware of this, are Sorry, average bubble anyway. rate and <laughs> utilization. So uh, these are focused on asking the question, okay, we have a team. They cost a certain amount of money. How do we increase the amount of revenue that they're able to earn for the business? So the first way of thinking about that is average billable rate. On average, for every hour that that team spends doing things for clients, how much revenue does that earn for the business? And a lot of people think of that as just being like, oh, well, what's the rate that we charge the client or what do we charge the client? But the other side of that is how long does it take us 
right? So the formula for this is AGI divided by hours spent doing that work, right? So if we had, just to give you a simple example here, show you this table. Uh, if we had a project where we had a $50,000 AGI and we spent 500 hours, our average billable rate would be a hundred bucks. Conversely, if we had a $10,000 project and we spent 50 hours on it, our average billable rate would be $200. So the amount of time that it takes you to do something is really important to this equation. And there's two sides of the coin. You can charge more for the same thing, or you can get the same thing done faster. Therefore, that same team can do more of that thing until you need to hire another person to do it. So that's average billable rate. I love this metric because you think about this, you can look at this for any time period and any section of the business. You could say, I want to look at my average billable rate for the week or for mm -hmm. the month or for the quarter. And I want to look at it for this one client or for this group of five clients or for this department, for this service line, for whatever. It's a really inexpensive and easy way to start to compare things and start to identify, okay, what stuff do we sell that you know, we earn a lot more revenue on for every hour we put in than you know, other areas of the business. And when you think about average cost per hour versus average billable rate, if you replace the delivery margin formula with those numbers, then you can get a proxy for delivery margin, right? It's the same exact equation, but instead of AGI, you're asking, what's my ABR? And instead of delivery costs, you're asking, what's my average cost per hour? So that's one lever to increase the amount of revenue that your team earns with the amount of time that they have. And then the other one is asking utilization. Of all the time I'm buying from them in bulk, because that's your business model, you go buy time in bulk from people for a flat price, and then you resell it at a profit, and everybody wins. Uh, what percentage of that time is it being used to get things done for clients? And obviously, the higher the percentage, the better. And those are our three levers. So to give you a practical example of how this would actually impact somebody's profitability or their delivery margin, I'll go to this formula here. Oh, I'm skipping right past it. I have a lot of slides. So let's imagine a situation where we have a team and that team has 10,000 hours of delivery capacity. That's equivalent to about uh, 10 full-time employees. And their utilization is 50%. So that means they spend 5,000 hours, or sorry, that's about five full-time employees. So they spend 50% of that time doing client work. Mm -hmm. On average, they earn $100 of revenue for every hour that they work. And again, it doesn't matter here if you're charging flat rates, you're charging by the hour, you're charging a retainer, you're using value-based pricing, you get paid in trident layers, whatever that is. Uh, this is for every hour they put in, how much work gets done. This team can earn 500K, right? If we take that same team and now instead of 50% of their time, 60% of their time gets spent on client work. Now that same team with the same average billable rate can earn 600K. And assuming that they're not getting paid a different amount, the business doesn't cost a different amount to run, that all goes straight to the bottom line. And then finally, if we take that same team, 10,000 hours at 60%, but now we just bump the average billable rate up to 125. And again, this could, we, we wouldn't have to change our pricing at all for this. We could just find a way to get done a little bit quicker. Now that team can earn $750,000 in the same time period. And again, wow. none of the costs have changed. And if you run an agency with uh, five full-time employees, you know that 250K could be the difference between being in the in the red and being very profitable. This is a substantial in, in, in difference. your summer home. <laughs> That's it. This is your summer home. This is your yacht. This is your, your child's education, whatever that is for you. You're, maybe you're trying to buy uh, the first ticket to get off of planet Earth when Elon Musk <laughs> populates a new planet and turns this planet into a ghetto, whatever that is for you. Okay. That's a little dystopian uh, humor for you, but uh, this is the impact that just focusing on those two numbers, right? Average billable rate and utilization, which are really inexpensive to measure, and you can do it frequently, and you can look at all kinds of different areas of the business. This is the power that these things have to give you a sense of how things are going in between when you get financial snapshots and you look at your financial statements, which are great, but they're usually kind of slow. You get them at the end of the month. They're three weeks late. So this gives you the power to get a sense of what's going on in between. That's basically it. Four numbers, delivery margin on your P&L, and then average cost per hour, utilization, average billable rate. If you look at those four things, you unlock 80% of the visibility you need to be profitable with about 20% of the work. And that's great because I think, you know, you talked about metric items, right? And it's like, we look at all these metrics and all these OKRs and KPIs and everyone's like, I'm going to measure everything. And, I'm, and I've been through that and, you know, and you're like, what should I be measuring? 
But when it comes to production, if you know these four things, you've got a pretty good handle on the business and you can manipulate like manipulate those things. And I'm going to talk about how you manipulate them a little further. Yeah. But you also talked about deciding on the profitable clients. And I think this is a big one that I've seen so often. I've been there where it's like, hey, this client is a hundred thousand dollars a month, but in the end, you're actually losing money. How are you going in? Is it, is it just simply using those numbers? Are you looking at acquisition costs? Are you looking at, you know, what are you looking at to make sure that you're selecting the clients that are the most profitable, but also enjoyable? It's a great question. Um, and so this comes down to a statement that I, I repeat, I find myself repeating all the time, which is most agencies are suffering from indigestion, not starvation. They just happen to feel the same. And often the way that their p is structured, they look the same on the PL too. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. I, I talked to an agency that was doing $3 million in revenue. And they were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. That agency is clearly not suffering from starvation. They have $3 million worth of opportunity coming in their front door every single year. But what they're experiencing is indigestion. The quality of that revenue is not where it needs to be. And so my framework for thinking through this is, you know, the way to solve indigestion is you start by looking at what you eat. It starts with having clarity on these things that I just talked about before you sell a project to a client. So what is the delivery margin that you expect to get on this project? Most clients that we work with, they don't have an answer to that question when they put a price in front of the client. What's the average billable rate that you expect when you put this uh, project in front of the client? And most clients don't have the answer to that question. And so how are you going to be profitable if you're not actually sure if the thing that you're selling is even setting you up for that outcome to begin with? And one of the really critical ideas here is separating pricing from scoping. They're related, but they're not the same activity. Scoping mm -hmm. is a question of asking yourself, what will it cost us to do this work? That should always be the first question that gets answered. And then the second question is, what's the client willing to pay us for this? And what are we asking them to pay us for it? And again, those are related, but they're not coupled to one another. And we all know as a service business, it's possible for us to sell something to a client and spend more than we got paid to get it done. Uh, and, and most of us as a badge of honor, we've, we've had that experience before. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to create separation between those concepts internally and start with what will it cost us and then contrast the pricing conversation to that. So that's really the first step. And then I can talk about um, on the back end, more things that you can pay attention to, to start to actually work the indigestion out of the business over time. Yeah. Let's talk about that. How do you work the indigestion out? Yeah. So one of my favorite reports to run is an average billable rate report. And this works for recurring clients and it works for project-based clients as well, where you sit down and you go, here are all of our clients or here are all of our projects or here are all the services that we sell. And you just measure the average billable rate. And then you start to notice things like, oh, this thing where we make most of our revenue, we actually have the lowest average billable rate there. We make like $80 an hour. And then this thing over here that we're not really paying a lot of attention to because it's a smaller percentage of our revenue, we make way more money for every hour we put in there. And as I showed you earlier, that difference is material. So if you run a recurring shop, what I love to do is I start practicing what we call revenue replacement. So we worked with a client that was doing several million dollars in revenue. They had all of their clients on retainers. And same thing, they were experiencing a ton of indigestion. So their pattern was we sell new work, we need to hire more people. So they would like sell new work, throw it on top of the pile, hire more people. The revenue went up, but their cost kept going up with it. And we said, hey, why don't you, next time you sell a new product project, figure out what the delivery margin is gonna be, make sure it's good. Go find your worst client with the lowest average available rate, the lowest delivery margin, and replace them with the new one. They were able to go grow 30% year over year and not change their headcount. All of that went straight to the bottom line by replacing revenue instead of adding revenue. And once they worked out the indigestion, then they had more cash they could get back to growing. And the same thing is true for project work. When you start looking at the analysis and saying, oh, there's this service that we don't really like doing and we don't actually make that much money with it. And it's like, okay, we'll stop selling that service uh, <laughs> or start asking for so much money that if somebody is going to work with you on it, they're paying you more money. So it's more worth it. And there's this thing that a coach of mine says all the time, which is people who pay, pay attention. A lot mm -hmm. of times the people that are paying you the most money, they take the engagement more seriously. And a lot of the growing pains will start to get worked out, but the data can really help you here. And starting with that average billable rate report is such a, a powerful way to start to get insight into 
uh, some of these answers and some of these areas for opportunity where it's a question of saying, okay, we need to either adjust the way that we sell this thing, or we need to stop selling it altogether and replace that capacity with things that are higher quality. It's funny because we think revenue equals profit, but it doesn't. And sometimes it can be the opposite. It can be, you know, driving stuff in, but now you can take this money then and use it to grow. Correct. I mean, that's, that's the big part. You talked about the agency growing 56% while growing 300% profits. How does this, I mean, obviously you spend more money in marketing, but how do you see people yeah. really using this change to grow faster? Yeah. Well, it, it comes back to um, a simple equation, right? Which is the way that an agency makes money is, and I'll, I'll share my screen again, cause you know, I'm a nerd is it's agency <laughs> gross income minus delivery cost, right? And the relationship between these two things is the delivery margin minus their overhead, right? Which is what it costs to run the business it equals profit. And so generally speaking, we wanna see delivery margin be above 50% and we wanna see overhead be below 30%. But if you have a delivery margin of 70% uh, or 80%, then you can start to make decisions. This is the thing is you get optionality. Do I want to take 50% profit out of the business and pay for my next yacht or my next summer home? Or do I want to over-invest in sales and marketing? Do I want to borrow from my bottom line today to invest in growth tomorrow? Do I want to get a bigger office space um, to plan ahead for when I grow my team? Do I want to hire uh, some more executive leadership I would a little bit ahead of when I need them to help push the business in the right direction. When you have strong delivery margins, you get to, profitability becomes a choice, right? And we talked about this earlier in SaaS, we talk a lot about the rule of 40, which is that your growth rate and your profitability should add up to at least 40%. So if you're growing 20% year over year and you have a 20% EBITDA, then the business is considered reasonably healthy. Lower than that, you have a systemic problem that has to generally do with your delivery margin. So when your delivery margin is strong, you can start to push some chips back into the table and start to choose how profitable you want to be. And those two things don't necessarily have to be in direct tension. They don't have to be a binary decision. You could say, sure, I'll take 20% out and I'll push the rest back into growth. I'm going to push the rest back into systems. I'm going to push the rest back into acquiring a business, whatever that is for you. But when you have profit, especially at the delivery margin level, you have optionality. And, and that's really the big thing. Um, because to your point, uh, growth is expensive. It requires a lot of cash. So the cash generation comes from delivery margin. And profit also makes your business more valuable, doesn't it? Way more valuable. <laughs> yeah, because we're talking about multiples of profit generally, or multiples of seller discretionary earnings, which is just another way to talk about profit. It, it has a substantial impact. That's amazing. You know, we're, we've talked about digital agencies, but this pretty much works for any service-based business, doesn't it? Correct. Yeah. And you'd be amazed at how consistent the ratios are. So of course, like, you know, I'm a marketer. Um, I understand the value of positioning. And of course there's nuance, there's language. And so we've really niched into digital agencies, but I spent a lot of time talking to the people that sell the software and the accounting services to landscaping businesses and legal firms and accounting firms. And it's all exactly the same. Anyone that's in the business of selling time has the same business model the ratios are amazingly consistent where the overhead is usually right around 30%. The labor cost is right around, you know, the same place. So yeah, to your point, this applies to anybody selling time. Oh yeah. It's fantastic. And you know, I, I, the reason coming back to our previous conversation just now is marketing is about growth and marketing is about building a better business. And if you're, if you're getting these numbers down, you have the profit margins to do it because I've seen so often that people don't, you know, there's, there's a, another piece of faith that's put into it too, isn't there? Because it's like, you, you know, that you're going to make money off of that client. So you, you'll go harder at getting that client. I think you kind of brought it up at the beginning, like the owners kind of sabotage it. Don't, if they don't believe in it. Yeah. It's, it's the founder led sales handbrake. And it's one of those things where, you know, of course, if you're still involved in delivery, there's a psychological cost that you bear every time you get on a sales call and you're like, oh, man, I'm going to have to pay for this after I sell it. And to your point, if you've had some bad experiences, you've lost money, you've suffered from the indigestion, those things are not always easy to identify, but they will impact your ability to, to sell and to push the business into a growth phase. So very important to address those things at the root. And it'll also help to 
curb some of the scarcity that I see hold back a lot of founders from growing because you know, if you're kind of living hand to mouth, it, it's very unlikely you're going to hire the person that you actually need to hire in order to get yourself to that next place to buy back your time so you can focus more on sales, so you can get out of delivery. Um, and the thing I see so many small, small agencies or, or budding agencies run into is they set the pricing up uh, based on them doing all the work and not really placing a legitimate value on their time. And then once they get too much work and it's time to scale, they have two problems they need to solve. The first is they have to completely rethink and restructure their pricing model to account for someone else doing the work that they have to pay now. And then they also need to go ahead and start actually building that team and those systems and hiring those people. So what I'm here to say is like, let's take that first problem off the table from day one and start thinking about our business as though we're never doing any of the delivery work and pricing it and looking at our margins in that way. And so getting started, you've, besides listening to this, I mean, you, we'll talk a little bit about how to work with you. You've got a, a toolkit uh, at parakeeto.com slash toolkit. We'll put a link in the show notes. You all know that by now, but if you don't, it's down there. Came in your email. If you got this via email, if you're not an email subscriber, you should subscribe via email because I want more people on my email list. But what's all in the agency profit toolkit? Yeah, the, the Agency Profitability cool Toolkit has a whole bunch of things in it. It has some training videos. It has templates, spreadsheets, cheat sheets to help you go deeper into the metrics that I talked about today and actually start measuring them for yourself, uh, running scenarios and, and looking at how changes in these metrics would impact your business. So I encourage you to check that out if you want to go deeper into what we're talking about today. Uh, it is a great place to start to start wrapping your head around uh, this problem that you know, I'm sure is not the thing that you got into business to worry about, but is inevitably going to, you know, become a thing that you have to worry about. Well, yeah, if you, if you don't worry about profit, you're not really in business, are you? That's the fact of it. And working with you, it's a three-step process. Tell us through that three-step process. Yeah. So uh, the way we work with clients is it starts with what we call our audit process. And that audit is exactly what it sounds like. We haven't given it a sexier name because we want to be transparent about the experience. We, we come in and we look at everything, your financial statements, your time tracking data, your project management data, how you scope, how you price. We do stakeholder interviews. And the purpose of that exercise is to really just show you the opportunity in the business, what's being left on the table and identify exactly what metrics need to be improved in order for your business to be uh, reaching its profit potential. Uh, so that's the first step the clients can take with us. And, and that could be all they do. The second step is where we actually work with you hand in hand to start measuring these metrics. And so we get into all of the, the nitty gritty details of how you're tracking time. Are you using the right tools? Are they set up in the right way? How do you pull data out of those tools and turn them into insights that are meaningful? Uh, and if you've ever tried to solve that problem, if you're in the middle of solving that problem, you know that it there's a lot that goes into it. And there's a lot of questions that you run into that are hard to answer. So we're there to help facilitate that process. And then the third option that you have to do at the end of that is to hire us to be your operations reporting team. So we take care of pulling your time tracking data, cleaning it, reporting on all of your metrics, and then sitting down with you to help you make sure you understand what they're telling you and make better decisions based on that data. And, and we can basically bring that muscle into the business so that you don't have to have it or build a team internally that has that muscle. So that, that's what we do. Awesome. And we'll put a link to Parakeeto. And where are you showing all your fancy charts on social media? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can find us uh, at Parakeeto um, on all social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. We also have a podcast called the Agency Profit Podcast. You'll never guess what we talk about there. Uh, and if you subscribe to our email list, um, you know, not just because I want you on there, uh, but that's where <laughs> appearances that I'm making, webinars, speaking engagements, and free Q&As that I'm doing, uh, you'll get informed about all of that and all new content content that we're publishing uh, on our blog, et cetera. So we just want to educate uh, the world and make this information free and accessible because I know how hard it was to find answers to these questions when I was running my agency. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, send, uh, I'll send links to you afterwards so you can put all that in the show notes, but come find us on social and then you'll get dragged into the vortex. You know how funnels work. We have one of those, so you'll find yourself in it, I'm sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but I mean, it, it's, it's super important information that I think everyone... Yeah, if you want to market better, you want to market more, you got to do this stuff. So, uh, Marcel, thank you so much for being on the Garlic Marketing Show. Thank you for having me. I love garlic and I love you and I love that you had me here and I hope everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> and thank you all for taking Marcel and I on your journey. This has been I Garlic and the Garlic Marketing Show.